Welcome back to another episode from Checking From Behind. I'm Zach, joined by with Preston as always, and now Jesse is with us from the Mug NHL as well. So I want to start off the episode. I know, Preston, you brought it up to me off air about apologizing to the Winnipeg Jets um, for what you said in the last episode, if you want to kind of explain Yeah, that. so for context, so Zach was asking us questions. Um, just It was like a kind of a rapid-fire questions, and one of the questions that we were asked was, this is two weeks ago, mind you. So lots changed in two weeks. Uh, he asked us, are the Jets the best team in the NHL right now? And we both, me and Jesse both said no. I think I, I put the Rangers and the Star uh, and the Panthers above them. I think we both agreed on that. Uh, well, I just want to admit, I was completely fucking wrong. Because, I mean, the Jets are 14 and 1. What are they, 15 and 1 now? Yeah. I know they were at least 15, yeah. Which is absurd. Just absurd. Right now, they're on pace to be the best team in NHL history. But uh, listen, okay, obviously it's not going to go that far. But the Winnipeg Jets are a team where everything's going their way now, right? And at some point, it has to fall and go the opposite way. But because... it's more than that, though. Like, they're playing good hockey. It's not like they're getting lucky bounces. Like, they're they're playing well. Like, no, they're earning course, their victories. It's not, yeah, like, it's not I, – I, this is sustainable, in my opinion, with the Jets. Who the, I, I don't know even who they lost to. I, I want to say Toronto. Um, Toronto did beat them. That's the okay. only team that's beaten them. Yeah. Yeah, six to four. So even then, they put up four goals. I mean, this dude is. This they almost came back in that game too. I think I'm pretty sure that game was like five one, and then it was like the Jets almost came back and tied that game up. So yeah, puts it yeah. in perspective. I mean, they've scored seventy three goals this season already, which is most in the league by almost ten. Well, they've only allowed well, I mean, thirty four yeah, goals. You, you look at it right now, like Kyle Connor's got 11. Mark Shifley's got nine. Ehlers has nine. And then, I mean, you go down. Neil Pionk's got is over a point per game. Morrissey's over a point per game. Velarde's at 14 and 16. Perfetti's at 13 and 16. Like, they've just got guys that are playing phenomenal hockey right now. They have yeah. 11 guys with 10-plus points in the first 16 games of the season. I don't think people understand how ridiculous that is. And me and Preston were raving about the Dallas Stars depth last season and why – they were one point away from the President's Trophy, why they went to the Western Conference Finals. And it feels like everybody is so awed in the fact of the Winnipeg Jets, best starter in NHL history. They are 15-1 right now. But I feel like nobody's talking about how many guys are actually contributing because it's all taken up by Kyle Connor and Mark Shifley and Connor Hellbook playing at the top of their game right now. And then you add in Nikolai Ehlers, who was in some trade rumors over the summer. He's proving why Winnipeg is smart to hold on to him. Neil Pionk, the same. Connor Hellebuck right now is looking to win back-to-back Vesna's. I think it'd be his third Vesna in his entire career, which is ridiculous because, he, listen, this team could go to new heights if he played this type of hockey in the playoffs. But outside of 2018... They, if they played like this in the playoffs, they'd win the cup easily. They, they would, but it, yeah. it's just... Like, they can't put it together in the playoffs, and, like, they've had hot start after hot start every single season. Yes? <laughs> we all know the Jets aren't going to go very far in the playoffs. <laughs> <laughs> I, shouldn't, I shouldn't say they're not going to go far because I, I don't know. But this just – there's so much going right for them right now. Like, everything is going right. And, I mean, you looked at the Bruins when they won 60 games, right? And they stru- – like, in the playoffs, they struggled because that was the first time they went through adversity. They didn't know how to handle it. They got they got beat. Look at the Tampa Bay Lightning. They got beat by the – they got swept by the Blue Jackets. <laughs> no. wild, That's the second still the funniest game. thing ever Crazy. in playoff it's history. Hilarious, it's hilarious, by the way. This Jets team, to me, yes, it feels different. It, do- it does feel different in the sense that it's like, okay, this team is dominant. They're playing the right way. They have the right goaltending. They've got defensive depth, and they've got depth at forward, and every forward is playing is playing well. Every defender is playing well. They There's no way this is sustainable, right? Like, there's no chance they go into the playoffs and just keep dominating this way. Like, I mean, I'd have to say, sure. The last Hellebuck, team sure. I remember starting off a season like this ridiculously was, I want to say, was the Chicago Blackhawks in the lockout shortened season where they were I just. Say. I think they do have the, the best start in NHL history. I think they, they had a better start I, than the, the Jets. The Ottawa so. Senators do that. Oh, what was it? 07 08 or 06 07, something like I that? I think. Okay, I think the Blackhawks in was it tw- either 12 13 or 11 12 was um like I think it was 36 their first 36 games they had a point mm-hmm. at least a point 
Yeah, which so, was absurd. And that was I think that was the 48 game season. Yeah, it was. Oh, insanity. And then they they did win the cup that year. I'm, I'm well, they kind of sure cruised through to the, the Stanley Cup that year. Like that's what this this Jets team right now kind of reminds me of is, you know, I, I have to go look through that playoff from the Blackhawks had. Pull that up real quick. They also yeah, got they, re, they get they got ridiculous goaltending in that play. I believe what was it? Corey Crawford was a goaltender then, or am I wrong? Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. I'm, I'll double check right now, but I think I I do think you're right. Because I think that was Crawford Pat- was Crawford single handedly won them a lot when yes. he was there. Right, so, yeah, underrated goalie, underrated goalie. Yeah, they finished the year thirty six seven and five that year. By the way, that's ridiculous. I'm gonna. Hold on. Um, okay, well, I'm looking back at this bracket for the 2013 uh, playoffs where the Blackhawks won the Cup. So yep. the only playoff series that looked remotely close was the second round. They almost they, uh, The seven-seed Detroit Red Wings took them to seven. Uh, other than that, they lost one game in the first round, one game in the conference final, and two games in the cup final. Yeah, it's not even close. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to pose I'm going to pose this question to you guys real quick. Um Obviously, sure. that was, what, a 40, 40-something game season. It was a shortened season, lockout season that started in mid-January. If that's a full 82-game season, I – now, I don't want to play the what-if game, but it's kind of like what if it's a full 82-game season and now you face no adversity. It's like the Bruins situation, like the Lightning situation where you go into the playoffs on all highs, and the second that something happens to you guys, you guys fall down, and maybe there's no cup. Now, again, that didn't happen, so I don't want to throw it up in the air, but I'm kind of doing that right now because I I don't want to – I don't know, maybe – I don't know. I, I will say this. If – to me, if the playoffs started today – your top two teams in the NHL are Winnipeg and Florida. And to me, that's not close right now. Okay. So if look at it this way, if you put the Florida Panthers and the Winnipeg jets in a playoff series, starting like tomorrow, for example, I've got the Panthers in seven. Give me Winnipeg. I have two. I don't know. I got the Panthers in seven. And here, the reason I say that is because you look at how dominant the Panthers have been over the last two seasons in playoff series. They've lost one playoff series in the last two years. Right, like went to the finals, lost, then went to the finals and almost lost to my Oilers. But beside the point, <laughs> they're still dominant when the playoffs come around. They've got guys that on their roster that will turn it up a notch and will single handedly well, win them. Yeah, yeah, the Panthers are built for playoff hockey. Yeah, without a doubt. Exactly, like that, and that's, that's, that's the where thing. they play their best. Exactly, and that's where I'm just like, are the Jets, are the Jets built for playoff hockey? We don't know yet. This, yeah, is... I mean, that's the thing I will say about this Jets team is I think they. Have, I think they do know how to deal with adversity because I mean this roster hasn't really changed a whole lot from the roster they've had la- like last year, where they got kind of their ass kicked in the first round by the the, the Avalanche. You know they, they they didn't really change much of this lineup, and you know I think Connor Hellebuck has a chip on his shoulder. You know I think he he has to hear all the chatter saying like, okay, you're a historically great regular season goal, you can't get it done in the playoffs, and I, I think this Jets team just has something to prove. I, okay, so I will say if the playoffs started today, I'm picking the Winnipeg Jets strictly because of the run that they're going on right now. Um, I mean, it's November. This is a stupid conversation anyway, but let me. It's still fun to do it. Yeah, you know what? Give, give me, the, give me the Caps. Give me the Caps. One in the cup. Four. Okay. I like I'm... the way you say. I like the way you think. Give me Edmonton, but I like the way you think. I nah, want to look. The cup I... final is going to be uh, Calgary. <laughs> Versus, All right, listen, uh, okay, guys. I the senators. Do you, th- do you think this would be a dumb comparison? Okay, uh, since 2018, okay, when they made the conference finals, they lost in 2019, lost first round. Um, 2020, they lost in the qualifying round in the bubble. 2021, lost in conference semifinals. 22 missed playoffs. Last two seasons, lost in the first round. Everybody talks about the Maple Leafs not having playoff success, and they get slammed for it. I. At some point, I'm wondering when do we like when should we start hearing that more surrounding the Winnipeg Jets? Because I get the Maple Leafs, you have Austin Matthews, Tavares, Marner, and all these guys. But like Winnipeg, though, you have a multi Vesna winning goaltender in Connor Hellebuck. You have Connor Shifley, Ehlers, even Morrissey, who has Norris potential if it wasn't for like three, four defensemen in this goddamn league hogging the damn thing. So like, when does it become a conversation where? 
you know, this team getting absolutely ba- like hammered time and time again for not having any playoff success. Like this team needs to get over the hump. It relies on Connor Hellebuck. I think it should rely on Connor Hellebuck. I think every single star has to step up in the playoffs if they want to have success. And if Connor Hellebuck ends up playing lights out in the playoffs, this team will go to the finals. But we just, I just want to see that. And I think they're the best team in the NHL right now. But that's that's just how far I'm going to take it at the moment. Well, I think a thing you got to understand with that, with the, I, I know the Maple Leafs get a lot of chatter every year about how they don't get into the playoffs. You have to take into account to the market size. And it's not really worth it for writers in the summer and like hockey podcasts to really talk about the Jets too much about, you know, lack of player success because they are the smallest market in the league. I know they're a Canadian team, but they have the smallest market. I think it's pretty I think I think the next closest team might be the Sabres as far as market size. Like for an NHL team, and it, it, it just comes down to like how much attention they can get in a team. It, it, I I agree with you that they should get some more flack for not having that playoff success, especially, you know, when you have one of the best goalies in the league, you've, you've had a solid team for years, you know, you have an underrated star, I think in Kyle Connor, but you know, it, it's, it's just, they're in Winnipeg and it's, it's team. It's not, it's not a, like in the United States. They don't really get any love mm-hmm. because it's Winnipeg. And I can guarantee you most Americans don't even know where the hell Winnipeg is. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm with you. Okay. Um, I, I want to move on to another Western Conference team here in the Colorado Avalanche because they seem to slowly but surely getting healthy. You get, I believe, Nachuskin comes back on the 15th. You're getting, um, not my, uh, Ross Cole in soon. Um, and Devin Taves is back as well. So this team right now, I think right now they're chilling in a wild card spot. They are one point behind uh, Edmonton. This team is going to be back. Georgiev is on pace for this. The team is the Georgiev is on pace to have the worst statistical goaltender season that we've seen in ten plus years, and this team still might make it to the what, playoffs. He's horrific. What's that? He's he's, he's been mean, horrific. I think I called this a couple of weeks ago. I I don't know if we were talking about it here or just with me and Zach, but I I, I was confident the Avalanche were going to be able to find their way out of this. I mm-hmm. think this roster still good, at least in the regular season is good enough to overcome their goaltending playoffs. It's a different story. But I'm not worried about the Avalanche. I wasn't two or three weeks ago, and I'm not today. And this is just proving me right. I mean, it's crazy when you think about the fact that Ivan Ivan is a top six forward on that team right now. <laughs> like he deserves, he does deserve to be in the NHL. Don't get me wrong. I love that guy. That that's one of my favorite players right now. That's Based a great name, team, Ivan Ivan. But there is no way he's a top six forward anywhere else in the NHL right now. But the problem, the difference is. He's actually been playing really well, and that's why, like, that whole team has just been playing phenomenally. Even though their lineup is, I'm just going to say, downright fucked, they're still playing really well. Like, I don't know if you guys saw this, but I think it was, this is named Nikita Prish, Prishapov or something like that? Seventh yeah. round pick in the 2024 draft made his NHL debut. He has five games played so far. Which is ridiculous to think about. And he he's actually looked good. Like, he's looked okay. He looks like he belongs there. Like, it's just everybody right now is just, like, mind you, everything's going right for them. Everything is just going, doing really well for them. I don't know. Is it sustainable? Probably as they get their guys back. But well, I, mean, I, mean, I, I don't know if this team has a chance in the playoffs at all, especially with Georgia having there, a seven-game yeah. series. Listen, okay, but... there, there's a name on the market that I'm going to throw out here, okay? Now, the Avalanche are going to have to make some cap work and everything, but what about Mackenzie Blackwood from San Jose? I knew exactly where you yep. were going with that. Yup. I knew that's where you were going, and I hate it <laughs> because I want the Oilers to go after him so bad, but it makes so much sense. Like, the, the fit is there, and the Avs will need to get a goalie at the deadline if they want to make a push. Like, I don't mind Georgiev as a 1B goalie right now, because he he is an NHL goalie, we've seen that. But the way he's playing right now, not a chance, right? So, um, you can't trust um, Anunin or whatever his name is. You can't trust him. You had, I think they had Kakinen for a bit there. Can't really trust him either. So you got to go get a goalie, and Blackwood does make a lot of sense. I would be curious if there's like anyone else on the market that actually makes sense for them. Like I'm just cool. trying to, like, I'm trying to like run it. Wise, I mean, Blackwood's there. Goalies so hold on, the Canucks, I don't know. The Canucks have three goalies right now. Maybe they snag one from the Canucks. If Demko's healthy, you, you can grab Lankin in. Um, 
Um, Gibson, maybe? Yeah, I was thinking him, but, I mean, the $6 million cap, if the Ducks are going to have to 50% retain for the Avs have a chance. Yeah. Um, I mean, right now, there's outside of those couple goalies we named, there's not many goalies that I can see really getting shipped off. Yeah, no, I mean, how often do you like, really see goalies getting moved? If, 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 I'm, if I'm the Avs... If I'm the Avs, I'm calling Montreal, and I'm willing to go all in on Sam Montembeau, Ooh. but he's not going anywhere. But he isn't going anywhere, right? Like, if I'm Montreal, you're not moving him. But if I'm the Avs, I'm offering up a lot for Montembeau right now. So, um, I I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think Montembeau is going to go anywhere. But you know, that's somebody I'd look at personally. I, just, I don't think it's real. I mean, I know Billy Huso's in the doghouse right now in Detroit. Oh, I mean, I, I doubt. Avalanche make a move for him. I I don't know if he is. I don't think he's fixable. much better than Georgiev. Now, granted, everybody's better than Georgiev, but not much better. It's not like a huge, a huge upgrade over him. I mean, it's better, but not a huge one. I mean, I think Blackwood makes the most sense. I think he'll be probably the most sought after goalie in the trade market at the yeah. deadline. Yeah, I, he I mean, he game. he's he's towing in San Jose, he's standing on his head every single. Game the other starts. thing, the other thing, that, uh, the other thing you got to consider, and this is like now that I'm kind of putting two and two together, Blackwood is going to have extremely high value because he's going to be one of the like probably the most affordable goalie at the deadline. He's going to be worth a lot. Like I'm not, you're gonna you're gonna think I'm crazy, but you look at how many goalies are affordable. You look at John Gibson; he'll be on the market. They'll have to retain to actually get like even move him right. Blackwood is affordable. Blackwood has proven he can backstop a team, even with terrible defensive. Like, you've got Cody Ceci on your first pairing. That's the worst defensive team in the NHL. I don't care what anybody says. That guy is terrible. Yep. Jason totally. Greger tried to argue with him on that. He's dead wrong. Whatever. <laughs> Moving on. Blackwood has been absolutely phenomenal between the pipes. I'm telling you right now, that will turn into a bidding war. If the Sharks were smart, they would wait till the deadline, let these offers build up. Oh, yeah. And honestly, you could probably sneak a first-round pick, a prospect, and then some. I I'm, was going I'm, to mention I'm, that. I think I, for uh, if you have a contending t- like a team that could potentially be a contender like the Avalanche, especially if they're healthy, you know, get rid of the playoffs. I could see them willing to give up a first round pick to give another chance to win the cup. I could totally see them. Here's the that. thing: like, you have the Avs who are like on the cusp of being a Stanley Cup team again, but they need a goaltender. The Oilers are the same way. If the Oilers can get back into the playoffs and turn like turn it around, all of a sudden they're going to go for a goalie too. Blackwood's going to be the guy that they look at. Then it's going to be a bidding war. Even if it's between two teams, it's still going to mm-hmm. be a bidding war, right? So um, there's going to be like I wouldn't say the Bruins actually because of Swayman, uh, Flames maybe if they sneak in there. Like there's a few uh, teams. I can't see the Flames team. buying at the deadline at all. Detroit might be I'm in if, team. I'm if who Detroit? Detroit. If they're in the thick of things. Yeah, because they only have 34 goalies in their system. Right now. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't see – Detroit's another weird situation to me too. I, I don't see them – Iserman I, hasn't really ever bought – It when feels like he sells at the right. deadline though, which is I the thing. I am to the Iser plan. Yeah. Dude, the Iser plan is fucking ass. I'm not going to get into that. But I think the Red Wings might, <laughs> might, they might <laughs> buy if they're like solidified in the playoffs right at the deadline, but that remains to be seen because they're in the thick of the mid-Eastern conference right now. But Dude, but it feels guy, like – like going through all these teams that it feels like they need a goaltender. Like I was talking about it with my coworker um, on Monday. It's like we're, we're talking about John Gibson. It's like you go through all the teams. It's like they either have an up and coming goalie in the prospect or they have an elite or startable goaltender. And then there's the teams where they have bridge goaltenders. Like we looked at the Blackhawks. So I think they're pretty content with their goaltending situation. I mean, we looked at maybe Philly could be interested, but they signed the Russian goaltender that to that horrible contract for some reason. I don't see Philly. I mean, I think the two teams that make the most sense to try to go and acquire a goalie, no matter what, is Edmonton and, and Colorado. I think those are the only two teams. Edmonton, for sure, has like a Stanley Cup contending roster, like forward yeah. defensive wise. It's just I don't know I don't know if, I don't think they could win with Stuart Skinner. I know he was great for them in the playoffs last year, but he has not been good this year, and they need a, at least a reliable backup goalie. We don't have to pivot to this for very long, but as an Oilers fan, I would love to bring up you said you mentioned Stanley Cup can, like contending roster. Appreciate that. <laughs> there are two guys on this team who need to turn it the fuck around if we want a chance, and it's Darnell Nurse, who has probably been the worst defenseman in the NHL mm-hmm. other than Cody CC. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan Nugent Hopkins has looked fucking terrible this season. 
Defensively, he's a liability. On the power play, he looks okay, but he can't get anything going. And then at five five on five, he he can't do anything. Like he's he's kind of just out there. That sounds like, like this guy had about... It sounds like he Jeff got 100 Skinner. points a couple seasons ago, bro. Jeff Skinner's been terrible. Don't even get me started on has that. Has he but... been that bad? <laughs> Nugent Hopkins like, has been awful. Like, yeah, I, I don't know how big you guys are on like, the analytical side of things, but if you look at the analytics, Nugent Hopkins might be the worst forward in the Western Conference right now. I think he'll bounce back. Oh, my I... fucking God. Sarf. Thank you. Dude. Yeah, you want to send me a picture of that so I can see it? Yeah. Thank you. Actually, here. I'll send you, I'll send you something that will actually make you, like, It'll it'll shock you a little bit. I'm, I'm gonna fucking send you this. Go for Nugent it. Nugent Hopkins statistic that I have. Okay, I'll send, send you this over. chart, Preston, and then um, I'll send you whatever he sends me. He to. has been awful offensively. He kind of he just looks lost. Oh He's kind of just out there like doing cardio, bro. Like I don't. I don't know. <laughs> All right, Preston. So I'm gonna read off the numbers here, okay? So you know I'm big into like charts and everything. Yeah. Uh, his overall percentile, seventeenth in the league. His offense is 13th. His defense is 45. His expected goals above replacement is negative nine and a half. Negative nine and a half for a guy who's supposed to be an offensive guy. His power play offense is good, though. His goals above replacement is a little bit over three. Hold on. Let's see. Oh, I'm I'm actually really, really scared. Oh, my God. Is this – did you just pull this up now, or is this a chart from a little this while This is from ago? a couple days. This is from, like – this is from before the game against the uh, Islanders. Preston, I'm sending you this thing. Okay. I'll also – here, I'll also send you the other one. Just to put just to put this into perspective, there's Darnell Nurses. Oh, I, I – Darnell then, Nurses sucks. He's trash. And then – Where's the other one at? And then I'll, just just to catch a stray, there's the last Sharks Flyers game. Look how bad Cody Cece was. That guy's awful. Oh, Cody Cece fucking sucks. I can't believe that he He's was terrible. actually playing for them in the hey, Stanley Cup final. Hey, story time. Story time. By the way, go for it. I'm on Twitter. Like I'm on Twitter like eight nine months ago, and Jason Greger decides to just start tweeting about how good Cody Cece's been in the playoffs <laughs> and how good Cody Cece is and how good of a defenseman he is. So every time Cece would have one good play. He would just start tweeting about how good he is. And it used to drive me nuts because I know CeCe's terrible. It doesn't take a genius to figure this out. Now, one day he's like, okay, I'm going to open this up. Everyone tells me that CeCe's bad. Explain to me. So me and this other guy who I have no idea who he is and I haven't spoken to him since this day, but him and I were going back and forth and we finally agreed. And he decides to like tweet at Gregor 67 clips of teams and players deciding to attack CC's side because it was the weaker side because they thought they had a better opportunity to beat him wide. And all we said was, here's clips of teams going to the weaker defenseman because they thought they could beat him. And he blocked both of us and then said, this doesn't count. He blocked. Basically, he blocked he why, what does this dude love? Why does he that? love? Why does he love Cody CC so much? I don't know, man. It makes it's no okay sense to, to me. admit I, that I, he's you wrong. You, like the guy is clearly not good. I mean, they dumped it to San Jose. He's awful. And then, like, when CC got traded, I'm pretty sure he was sending out tweets like, I don't understand this move, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Jason Greger just proved how dumb he was. And he blocked me on Twitter for some reason, so I don't – whatever, man. He's – yeah. That's... Defending Cody CC like that was crazy to me. That is hysterical. It's okay. Oh. It's okay to admit when you're wrong and when a player is playing bad. Like, it, that's not a bad thing, especially when you're in sports media, sports journalism. Like, what are we doing here? Let's go, Greger. Fuck, man. Holy shit, Cody CeCe's ass. And now, granted, I like to remind myself that I'm not on an NHL team, so who cares? But that's just me. Um, I want to move into the uh, Penguins here real quick about I feel like at this point they need to blow the entire roster up. Everybody has been made available per sources except Sidney Crosby. Um, and I think that comes to an extent. I think Malkin, yeah. As you say that, I just got a text saying that the Penguins are likely – they just put Noel Achari, Michael Bunting, Alex Nedeljkovic, Marcus Pedersen on the trade block, and they're trying to move them quickly. Oh. So that's going to be – Perfect timing. That was perfect. I love that. I, mean, I love that. I mean, uh, how, how much do these players actually have decent value, though? You I get mean, you bring in. It doesn't matter how much value it is. You bring there's in a some goalie. Type of let's, go, let's go back to that. There, there's a goalie that teams will actually look at that's affordable. Is he Nadelkovic, a starter? No chance. You know, Nadalkovich will get some eyes. Yeah, yeah. No, he'll exactly. he'll get some attention. Yeah, 
but like bunting Michael maybe, maybe like Charlie's a, a good depth forward, but I don't know. Pedersen will yeah. get some looks. I Marcus, Marcus Pedersen, Pedersen is a very underrated defenseman. I will say. I agree. I, I, I look, agree. just looking at this roster, a lot of the problem players they they can't move on from, so they're kind of no. fucked. Like they're fucked. I think they're there's fucked. only a couple guys you don't move on move on from. Obviously, there's Sidney Crosby. Malkin, you're not moving on from. The only reason you're not moving on from Carlson is because he's untradeable because of that cap hit. And I think Latang. I think anybody else you can go ahead and trade. So they have five players on their team with a complete full no movement clause. Sidney Crosby, Gunny Malkin, Eric Carlson, Chris Latang, and Brian Rust. I like Rust. I've always liked Brian Rust. I thought he was fantastic. Dude. Marcus Pedersen right now is in the 97th percentile in offense. That's crazy. I mean, Brian Russ has not played a game this year yet, so I hey, will what just say What injury that. is he dealing with? I'm not sure. What? But... I didn't realize he hasn't played a game yet. I swear to God Me he's either. played a game. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at his too. stats I'm right now. I might be losing my mind. 24-25. No, he's, he's played games. He's played games. Well, then. Why is it, okay, I don't know why this is wrong. I'm looking at cap wages and they have the stats. And they don't he, okay, have no, hold on, hold on, hold on. It says he's he played, did start to, he's played he's 11. Played, okay. he, I, I'm wrong, man. I, the web, the no, no, it's all good because good. I like the first thing I loaded up was a site that said he hadn't played this season, so I get where you're coming from. But the NHL site says he, he has played 11 games. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. Okay, I stand corrected. He has played, but I mean, that's an unmovable contract. I mean, he's. Solid second, third line player, five million dollar cap hit. I mean, Ricardo I mean, Kell, I, I mean, you can't, you're not moving Eric Carlson to Chris Tang, Ryan Graves. Oh, Ricardo Kell is such a good piece, though. I listen, okay. I, I, bringing up Ricardo Raquel, I wonder if you can get something back for him at the deadline if you're out of it. Like, genuinely, I, I think you can get something, some His decent term might not back. force that, though. Yeah, it's four more years, if three more years after this, at five million dollars a year. Or my, uh, that's a, not a bad contract for him, though. I mean, that's not that's bad not... if he's gonna put up 60, 65 points for you. I mean, he's at eleven and seventeen games right now. I'd much rather have him than Ryan Ryan Nugent Hopkins right now. That guy pisses me off. Sorry, bro's like, about that to, bro's so about. To... <laughs> I was about to lose my mind. That guy's terrible, bro. You're paying Raquel five, but you're paying some liability five and a half. I don't know. I whatever, man. I mean, Raquel oh, is playing. Raquel, Raquel right now is playing some really good hockey. So I mean, if he keeps it up, you can. Oh, I have no I issues with Raquel. I'm just looking at guys that could potentially move because apparently they want to stay contenders as long as they have Sidney Crosby. I, I just do not see how that is possible. They're not going to. They don't have. Yeah. They can't. Part. They can't. In order to become a contender again, they're gonna have to just go in a full out rebuild and be bad. Like that's the only way they're Literally. gonna be, be good, and that rebuild is gonna be terrible. By it the way, it is going. They're best, they so traded away their bad. best prospect for Rutger McGrady, who doesn't look legit. The Jets won that trade. I don't care what anybody says. But oh yeah, Rutger McGrady is an NHL player, but my God, did he look bad when he played his first three games in the show? Oh my God, he didn't God. look ready. Then, no, he's and he's not ready, and I don't know why he thinks he is. Like I get wanting to play there, but. You are gonna. I just don't it's think gonna you be Rutger McGrady. When that when that rebuild eventually starts, it's gonna be Rutger McGrady, Eric Carlson, and then the next best player is gonna be Derek Ryan. Like that's how bad that rebuild is going to be. I I remember when the stuff came out about Rutger McGrady demanding all this stuff, and it, the, I posted like a TikTok. I clipped it out from our podcast episode, and I put it out. And some dude started telling me to stop spreading false lies and that he knew his family and everything. Like, this is completely false. And I was like, okay, can I have a reliable... Well, he was asking to be traded? Like, he was... He, no, that he was demanding for all, like, this playing time and this but trades you're, and all you're this, you're right? You're incredible NHL reporters and then, saying that. And then I was like, okay, do you have a viable source that you can give me that says that and I can go check it out? And I got no response at all. And you had... Reliable sources, Friedman, Cervelli, the list goes on saying it, and it was a waste of time. And I found that really. I'll ridiculous. say directly since since I'm a little since I'm a little tapped in, I'll back you up on this. He absolutely asked for a trade. The way that it was explained by some insiders was a little blown out of proportion, but he definitely he wanted the playing time. He wanted a guarantee, like on the roster opening night, and like. The way he went about it was it was more requests than demands, if that makes sense. Like, he wasn't okay. sitting there like, oh, I need this or I'm going to be traded, right? Like, it was more, I would like this, and he didn't like 
the Jets plan with him, which is fair. Like you, you don't have to like the, your development plan, but it was more, he didn't agree with their way that they saw his future and he thought he was ready more than, Oh no, he is just a, a dickhead kid that thinks he's just yeah. too good for the NHL. No, I, like, I, he got sent down by the penguins. He got sent down by the penguins and he's just like, all right. He likes their development plan better because they're going to give him the opportunity. So I don't know. He just had a bad relationship with the Jets. It is what it is. It happens, right? So there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, exactly. I think the Jets uh, getting Braden Yeager back, I think, is a pretty good return. So that was ridiculous. It's a great return. So, when I saw that, like Friedman tweets out McGrory to Pittsburgh. I'm like, oh, sick. Like a third round pick's going to the Jets. Like, cool. Braden Yeager's a Jet. I'm like, huh? Why did he decide to swap prospects like that? Dude, I if think- you. I think Dubas's mindset was they need young players in the lineup immediately, and they probably think McGordy's farther along than Jaeger. And just to get some young talent that at a cheap cap hit into the lineup, I think that was a priority for Dubas over anything. I mean, Jaeger's gonna yeah, be a problem. Yeah, I, I agree that was Dubas's mindset. I think his – now, I'm not an NHL GM, so I don't know shit, but I think his mindset should have been if we can somehow – even trade a pick or trade like a veteran for somehow trade a veteran for Rucker McGrory. You can have McGrory and Jaeger together and kind of kickstart things a little bit and have both of them. But now you have to trade swap a one for one, but it could have been, it could have been. Yeah. No, no, no. I was going to say, because I remember seeing, and I don't remember if it was Friedman or Saravalli or whoever it might've been, but I remember someone saying that there was like a four team bidding war and the penguins weren't involved. And there were teams offering like a second and then a team threw in like a second and a third. And then there was like a second and like a B level prospect. So there was like a slight bidding war and the jets kind of just said, all right, who's going to offer us the best. And all of a sudden Dubas comes in. Yeah. We'll give you Braden Yeager. And it was just like, yeah, absolutely. Like this is a guy that yeah. could at least at bare minimum is evens with McGrady right now. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You got a first round prospect for a first round prospect prospect. I mean, I do. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I get McGrady's probably a, Going to be in the NHL before Jaeger. I believe Jaeger's playing in juniors again this year. But, you know, for the Jets, look at look at how they're playing right now. They clearly don't need a young player in their lineup right away, and they can afford to wait for Jaeger to be NHL ready. So I think that was a, a genius move by the Jets. It, it was a great oh. move. They waited. They weren't in a rush to get rid of McGroarty, and bang, came in an impulsive move by Dubas Happen, got, got it done right away. I mean, I do feel for Dubas uh, a little bit, though, because I feel like he's uh, – I think a lot of these demands are coming from ownership and Sidney Crosby saying, do whatever you need to do to get this team to win right now. And, you know, look at that cap situation. I don't know. I mean, trade it for Eric Carlson was a mistake. I think he'll, I think he can admit that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. But you know, there's not – I don't know how many more, more other moves you could have made to try to make this roster better. I mean, when you got Sidney Crosby telling you, get this player, you – you kind of got to listen to him. I don't know. I've it's yeah. I mean, I just looked at it by the way. Jaeger's got 24 and 17 with Musha on the dub, so he's doing his thing. Now, here's one to think about McGrody thinks he's NHL ready, by the way. He put out he had three games in the show with the Penguins, had no points. He's got mm-hmm. 10 games with Wilkes Barre in the AHL, he's got three points, and he's minus five. Yeah, probably a little bit of humble pie there. That's not impressive. Yep. I, I mean, I think it'll be fine. I think he probably it was probably good for him to face the adversity. I mean, He'll probably I think be better off in, for it, but a year in the AHL will help him tremendously. Even if he gets off to a slow oh, start like he is now, I mean, the second half of the AHL he could pop off. I mean, he just he needs some time just playing professional hockey in general because coming right from I believe what he was the captain of Michigan. Yeah, NCAA, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, coming like the transition right from NCAA into the NHL is a hard transition. I would, I would potentially argue it's a harder transition going to the NCAA to NHL than going from the CHL to the NHL half the time. I don't know. NCAA has kind of changed over the years. They're getting a lot more NHL prospects, and I think you're gonna we're gonna start seeing a lot more guys making that jump right away. I mean, with what just happened with the, I believe it's um eligibility with NCAA opens eligibility for CHL players. I know you're what you cover the Edmonton Oil Kings, correct, Jesse? Um, I do. I what do. what's your take on that? Do you think it'd be something that is great, good for the league at all? Oh, it's been a long time coming, man. Like it's been something that a lot of people have wanted for a while. It's something that'll help junior hockey as a whole, right? So. I mean, it's not even going to help. It's not just going to help the CHL either. Like, you've got the KIJHL, 
the the uh, the PJHL. You got the junior A leagues that are now going to be a part of this development plan with the WHL and the NCAA. It's going to be so much more of a development league where they're trying to push CHL to NCAA to the NHL, right? So they want to be the premier league in the entire world for development into the NHL. And I think it's fantastic. The vibe that I get from around for who I've asked, everybody's excited. Everybody's pumped. There's, there's players that are super excited about it. Executives, GMs are super excited about it. I haven't had the opportunity to talk to any executives with the Oil Kings about it, but I've got some statements from players. I've got not directly to me, but I know people that know people that know people. And it's just, it's, there's no negatives on it. Right. So the only leagues that I think could be severely affected by it is the BCHL and the USHL because kind of hinders them. What reason do you have to go to these leagues anymore? So, uh, yeah, yeah, I agree with you, especially on the USHL part. If you, yeah. Going juniors or college is probably the best option for most players. I mean, I feel like yeah. there has to be a middle ground because I believe eligibility, well, it's not eligibility, but like the rights, NCAA is what? It's four years? Is it four years or three seasons? Four. Four. Yeah. And then the CHL is two years. Till your 20 year old, till your, till your 20 year old years. So technically, you could play anywhere from two to four. Okay. So then there has to be something because since. Those two, there's a little bit of a gap. I feel like there's going to be one where it shares the same amount of rights you have. So maybe do three, do two, do four, whatever it may be. But I heard, because I, I just listened to the 32 Thoughts podcast with L.A. Freeman, whatever, and there's some stuff going around that they're going to meet in the middle. It's just a matter of when, not if it happens at this point. Yeah, yeah. And – I still have to actually ask around because like I've got some, I know some people that still play in the BCHL. I know some people that still play in the USHL. So I've got to reach out. I got to see what the vibes are there because over the last couple of weeks, players have made it clear in those leagues that they want to leave. Like a few BCHL guys have signed in the queue. Like there's been eight or nine as soon as that news came out. So there's a lot of moving parts to this too. Like the, the scholarship and development agreement that the dub has has to be, it has to be altered slightly now. Right. So they, there's a lot of things they got to do. It's not a bad thing. There's just a lot of like steps they have to take for it to actually start being a successful transition. And I think it will be. Um, but I wouldn't say right now that the BCHL and USHL are also fucked by any means. I think they could still find a way to be strong development leagues. I also hate this thing where it's like, yes, they left Hockey Canada. Yes, they're outlaw leagues. But it's junior hockey. It's another league where they can be seen by NHL teams. Let them develop. Who cares, man? Like, if they're going to combine with the OHL, they're going to combine with the CHL. Who cares? Just let them, like, it is what it is. I think it's going to be a positive. I think it's going to be positive. I think I think it's going to go well. I think it's going to be a good thing. It's, it's going to be great for the NHL, CHL, and CAA. Every single league that's involved outside of those two that you named the USHL and then the BCHL. Yeah. That's going to end it for today's episode. Thank you guys for joining us. Jesse's um, social medias are all going to be down in the description below. Go check them out. Follow him. Do all of it. Thank you guys for listening again. Subscribe, notification bell. See you guys in our next episode.